following interview was con was conducted with George T. Schilling for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, April 4th, 2008, at its residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, and thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in your early years. All right. I was born in, in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, the home of that other university, uh, which we don't talk about too often here at Purdue. Uh, my mother and father were both graduates of Indiana University. My mother's home was in Bloomington. Her father was a physician. I knew all four of my grandparents. Uh, my father was raised in Logansport. He uh, went to uh, IU uh, on a six-year program. At that time, you could get a law degree in six years. You had three, three years and then a year, uh, four years and then two years of law. Uh, it's interesting, at least to me, that in his uh, law class were some well-known people. Wendell, Wendell Wilkie, Republican candidate for president, Sherman Minton, United States Senator and Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, and Paul McNutt, who was governor later, all those men. My father never practiced law, but he went to, uh, he joined the S.S. Kresge Company in the real estate department in Detroit, Michigan. After That's he got, a his, law, after of he got his law degree? After a, yes, okay. and after... Uh, I, I, I was, uh, he, he went into the Army in 1917. They were married in April of 1918, and I was born 11, 12 months later. And uh, when I was a year old, we moved to Indianapolis and then to Detroit, where he joined the real estate department of, uh, of uh, S.S. Kresge, which later evolved into Kmart. And uh, so we lived there through my grade school years. <clears throat> and uh, then in 1932, he was offered the job of uh, the head of the real estate department of Montgomery Ward based in Chicago, and we moved to Chicago. And uh, I entered uh, New Trier High School in Evanston and became very ill my first semester before Christmas, uh, so much so that they looked around for a warm place to send me away from the north shore of Chicago. We lived in Winnetka. And uh, by various uh, happenstances, uh, uh, I ended up at Kentucky Military Institute because that school in January of 33 uh, moved the entire school to Venice, Florida for their first year of Florida, although that had happened under different ownership years before. KMI was an old, old, the oldest private military school in the country. So I was shipped off to uh, uh, Venice, Florida with uh, about 200 other cadets and, uh, as a high school freshman, uh, weighing very little after a bout of pneumonia hardly able to lift the rifle that they handed me, <laughs> so on. And I loved KMI and spent the rest of my high school years at KMI. Was it just in Venice for the freshman year? No, only? The fr oh. no. We, we, would go, we went to Venice in January, right after Christmas vacation, came back on a special train in April to Kentucky, stayed in Kentucky, and, and uh, then summer vacation, and then in uh, September we rejoined the school in Kentucky, and stayed there till the next January. And then each year we went to Florida. In the winter. In the winter. And that was marvelous. That was the beginning of the snowbirds, right? <laughs> yeah, and, that's right. And it was a, a superb education. These uh, four men, one of whom ran it and the others were all teachers, had all been college professors and they wanted something a little different. So I graduated uh, then at, uh, at KMI and 1936, and of course went to Indiana University where my parents had gone, and my grandparents lived, and other relatives lived. So there was a built-in family support for this young college student. Uh, I joined the 
my father's fraternity, Delta Tau Delta. Uh, what was the campus like? Tell us a little bit about being in college in those days. What was it like down there? Well, it was uh, the student population was about twenty five was seventy five hundred. It was twenty five hundred when my parents graduated in nineteen seventeen and eighteen. When we came to Lafayette in 1946, I think Purdue was about 7,500. Uh, it was very nice. Uh, your life, my life, revolved around the uh, the Delt House. Uh, I was head of the freshman class and then later president of the house. Very involved in fraternity matters, interfraternity matters, campus activities. Uh, my grades were very good, and they gradually got worse as I discovered girls and Bach beer and all those social activities, pleasures of college. <laughs> and uh, it was during those years. Uh, my parents still lived in in the Chicago area, but I had not lived there since uh, I went to KMI in 1933. Uh, I have a brother and sister. They both went through high school in uh, in uh, Hinsdale, suburb of Chicago. Uh, the summers we spent at Glen Lake, Michigan, up near Traverse City, uh, since I was nine years old. And uh, uh, there I met on her 16th birthday my wife, Barbara. Her parents had come from the Traverse City area, although they lived and she was born in Tennessee. But we were there as summer people and we met. And uh, five years later, in 1942, we were married and about to celebrate our next year. This year will be 66, I guess. Very nice. So uh, during the summers, I had. Uh, uh, my days at the at the lake, I worked part time in Traverse City, various jobs. But my main effort was courting my wife. It was the last two years of college, she went to Syracuse University uh, and had a brother at Cornell and a brother at West Point, and that's why she was there at Syracuse. They were close at hand. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, then I graduated from IU in 1940, and uh, that fall entered Michigan Law School. I didn't apply anyplace else, I just wanted to go to Michigan. And it was a good law school, still is, and it's, uh, those were very enjoyable years there. I was there three years. What about uh, the war? The war was kind of Well, I, I went to... I entered Michigan in 1940. Were you, me, were you married at the time? We got married in 42. Okay. Uh, Pearl Harbor was December, of course, in 41. Uh, I had, I was subject to the draft at that time. I don't know whether I was actually deferred in, or, to finish school or whether it happened to work out that I wasn't called. Barbara thinks I was deferred. I was a resident of Illinois, so I was subject to the Illinois draft. At any rate, I went through summer school of 42, and we were married that September. And in 43 in February then, I graduated, and a week later, I was drafted and went in the Army. And I uh, went to uh, basic training out in uh, California, and first in Texas. Uh, and uh, having been through military school, I knew something about the military, <laughs> although Army was a shock. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether it's germane to this or not, but it's kind of, by happenstance, I happened to get to go to Officer's Candidate School, and that happened because during basic training, along with the other draftees, we were being drilled one day, and... Uh, the sergeant drilling had to leave us, and he said, anybody here drill this outfit? And like a dummy, I knew you were not supposed to volunteer, but I did. Going to impress everybody, I guess. 
So while I was drilling, the group, uh, the, the captain came along and stopped and pulled me into his office and said, who are you and where did you come from? And what do you know? And when he found out I had, a, had already had a law degree, I was a little young. I had skipped the third grade during grade school. Uh, he said, well, now you're my company clerk. I'm promoting you to corporal so you can go to OCS. And he <laughs> sent me to OCS in a couple months. So I went to uh, officer's candidate school. I like that. And was commissioned as a second lieutenant in anti-aircraft artillery. I was trained on a, an aircraft weapon, a 40 millimeter an aircraft weapon. Well, we were married, and uh, uh, after graduating from OCS, uh, I was assigned to a, a camp in California, and we drove out there and found myself in a pool of anti-aircraft second lieutenants. They didn't know what to do with us. They had too many of us. Uh, by that time, anti-aircraft wasn't as important as they thought because we were gaining air superiority in Europe in the war. So we did calisthenics and went to a few classes that we'd already taken. <laughs> and uh, then they asked for volunteers to go to the Pacific Theater as an aircraft officers on board troop ships. So we decided we had a choice of Seattle or San Francisco and we said Seattle for some reason we'd never been to Seattle, so we got in the car and went to the Seattle port. And I reported for duty and expected to come out and kiss her goodbye and get on a ship. But I was assigned to Fort Lawton, which was on the outside of Seattle. It was an old fort, originally designed to protect Seattle, and it was converted into a staging area for the Seattle Port of Embarkation. The troops that went through the port were processed there. I was assigned out there, not as a lawyer, but just assigned out there. And gave basic training to troops and had various jobs and so on. And began to, then they found out I had a law degree. Well, I hadn't practiced law. I didn't uh, know a courtroom from a battle Did you get a chance <laughs> to pass the, take the bar before you got drafted? I didn't. I took the Michigan bar. Hmm. Uh, and later, when the war was over and I came to Indiana, I never had to take the Indiana bar because the Indiana Supreme Court had a rule that if you had passed a, a bar exam in another state and had graduated from an accredited law school before the next Indiana bar was given, and you went in the service before it was given, you were forgiven. So I never took the Indiana bar. But I had taken it. was a nice, nice Michigan. arrangement. Yeah, it was good. So I did get into legal work and served as general, as a defense counsel, as prosecutor, and as the law judge in military courts. And then I was finally transferred to downtown Seattle to the, to the Judge Advocate General's office at the Seattle port and was there doing legal work with the Judge Advocate General's office for about the last almost year, I guess, of the years I was there. And so then we were discharged. Uh, After the war, this war was over? The war was over. It was in 46 in March. The war was over in four, previous 45. Yeah. I finally got separated from the service, as they say, after a six months struggle to do so. We had a baby. And uh, so when Carolyn was born in Seattle, she was a year old, we arrived in Lafayette. Lafayette because uh, <clears throat> I didn't know where I was going to practice. I had uh, an offer from a large firm in Detroit that the man, chief partner I was acquainted with before, who said he wanted me to join the firm when I got out of the Army. Uh, so I, I went to Chicago, and I was interviewed and offered a job at uh, one of the big firms there. Winston Strong represented the Chicago Tribune, among others. Uh, but we had no place to stay, so we came to Lafayette. And during the war, my father had retired uh, partially and had bought a farm near Lafayette as a hobby. 
And so they were living there at the time. So here we came with Carolyn because it was a place to stay. And I then met Roger Brannigan, who had represented my father in the purchase of the farm. And he, with Allison Stewart, was in the Stewart Law Firm. Uh, and I got acquainted with Roger. I'd known Roger slightly before. In fact, while we were married and living in Ann Arbor, uh, he was our first dinner guest. He was sent to Ann Arbor to the Judge Advocate General's School for Judge Advocate General's officers. Uh, their basic training was given to them at the University of Michigan Law School. Mm. And, and we happened, Barbara and I were there. So we had him to dinner. He had volunteered for the service and had been commissioned directly, as did other lawyers. And he had said to me, uh, when you get out, why come down and talk to me? Uh, he then went to, uh, ended up in the Pentagon as chief counsel for the Transportation Corps. And he wrote me and said, uh, would you like to come down there? And I thought, yes, but nothing materialized out of that. Uh, so when we got to Lafayette, I, of course, talked with Roger, and he p persuaded me that I should be practicing with the Stewart firm. Uh, but he didn't have the sole voice on that, but Mr. Stewart did, and after a couple months, he, he'd never had an associate before at the firm. Was it just the two of them? No, oh. it was Allison Stewart. Uh, judge Duvall, Judge Brenton Duvall had been a judge in Frankfurt and had Allison had asked him to join the firm. The firm was an old firm. Okay. It's over 125 years old. Okay. Allison's uncles and cousins had formed the firm. But there's Allison and Roger Brannigan, and Judge Duvall, Mike Ricks, who was a Lafayette boy, and uh, Cable Ball, who was then Stuart Duvall. Branding and Ball and Ricks. And so I joined in July of 1946. At that time, Allison Stewart was president of the Board of Trustees of Purdue. His uncle, I guess it was, William Sir, had been president of the Board of Trustees. The firm had represented the university for many years. And Allison had been acting also as counsel. However, the, the, the Board of uh, Trustees had, and during my years, had, and maybe still has, a policy that if you're a member of the board, you do not do business with the university. Uh, Allison, therefore, represented him as counsel and as board member, but he did not participate he, in any fees that were charged to the university. That was the arrangement that was made with the university. Uh, and so it was uh, exciting. He was a marvelous person, a lawyer's lawyer, very courteous. Uh, he had graduated of Princeton and Michigan, or uh, Northwestern Law School. He told me that when he had graduated from law school, he went to New York, get a job, going to be a big time lawyer, and. Uh, managing partner in this big firm said, Mr. Stewart, we'll give you a job. But you think about going back and starting a big time law firm in a small city. You, you come from an old firm, go back and make that a big city firm in law. And in my view, that's what he did. And, and so he uh, uh, got uh, Brannigan in. Roger Brannigan came from Franklin and you maybe know a lot about him, and I won't go into it, except he came to the firm. He was general counsel for the Federal Land Bank of Louisville. This was during the Depression. And he hired a lawyer. He was responsible for Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio. And he hired lawyers handling mortgage applications for farmers uh, throughout those three states. So he knew lawyers mm -hmm. uh, through those three states and hired a, a lot of lawyers. Uh, and so... Allison asked him to come to the Stewart firm. Uh, where, was, where were you located at that time? We were lo in the same building they're in now. The building was built 1919, the year I was born. 
It was the Lafayette Life Insurance Building. And they still call it that. I know they do. I don't know why. It right. should be the Stewart Building. It's owned by the law firm. Uh, uh, the firm bought it some year or two after I left. Uh -huh. The firm bought the building. Okay. But we're, we were then, oh, three or four offices on the eighth floor. Now they occupy, I think, six through ten and rent the rest of it out. And the firm now has um, 30 to 40 lawyers and an Indianapolis office. But in uh, my first experience with Purdue in the law was, it must have been February of 47, when the bleachers crashed in the field house. Allison was then president of the board. And uh, of course that was, uh, some people were killed. Right. It was a devastating blow. And I remember vividly that next morning. I was there, but I was... Were the you other, at the game? I was at the game, but I was at the other... Uh, I was getting a hot dog on the other side of the field house when the bleachers, which I had been sitting at, collapsed. Wow. And the next morning, Allison Stewart <clears throat> called me in the office and he, he said, we need some legal research on the liability of the university. He says, don't come out of that library until you've got some answers for me. Well, the answer I came up with was, was apparently right. The university was not responsible because the law was still stemming from the old English law that the sovereign is king and you can't sue the sovereign, so you can't sue the state without its consent. And no suit was ever brought against Purdue. Suits were brought against the manufacturer of the bleachers and so on. So uh, I developed a wonderful relationship with uh, Allison Stewart. He always got to the office early. And I got early, and I got earlier, and he got earlier. And it ended up that for some period of time that we would have a one-to-one -one talk before anybody got down there. You get a lot done with that one right there. Wonderful. Right. Not mm -hmm. just about the law, but it was a great gentleman. Uh, then in the next year, I was made a partner, and uh, I began to undertake uh, trial work for the firm. And I began to do some work for Judge Duvall, who had taken over as counsel. Uh, Allison had re refrained from being counsel, and Judge Duvall was doing the work. And the, the Counsel to the board? For counsel for the board of okay. trustees. All right. And uh, uh, in the course of that, uh, there came one of the bond issues for one of the dormitories. And I got to assisting him with that work with R.B. Stewart. And that's how I became acquainted with R.B. Well, we got along famously. And I did more and more of the work, although the judge was in charge and he was responsible. Well, in 1950, <clears throat> on Memorial Day, Judge Duvall died suddenly of a heart attack. In September of that year, I was, or in, in January of that year, uh, Cable Ball left the firm and went into practice by himself and uh, had been elected to the legislature. So he left the firm. Uh, in Memorial Day, the judge died. In September, Allison died. So that left three of us as partners, as Brannigan and Mike Ricks, who was older than I, and uh, and Roger. In that same in that summer, John Bodle had joined the firm as an associate. This is 1950. In 1950, and George Rinker joined the burn, uh, firm as an associate. Well, when Allison died, Governor Shirker appointed Roger Brannigan to succeed Allison as trustee uh, of on the board of trustees. And R.B. Stewart then asked Roger for, for me to be counsel for the university. And, and R.B. made a change at that time. He said, uh, I want the counsel to meet with the board. Of course, before the counsel, I don't know whether Judge Duvall ever met with the board. I, I don't think he did. Of course, Allison sat on the board. And Roger, who never really acted as legal counsel, was on the board. 
Uh, Arby said, I want, not only, I want the legal counsel to meet with the board, I want them to be an officer of the board and elected by the board uh, every year. This, of course, cleared, being cleared with President Hovety, whom I had met at Allison's home, and, and we had a nice relationship. So that's how it started, and I became legal counsel for the Board of Trustees, which meant also you were counsel for the university and the research foundation and whatever. My principal work percentage-wise, hourly-wise, would have been with R.B. Stewart, who I regarded as a, a very brilliant, innovative individual. Uh, he did tremendous service to Purdue. Uh, President Hubley I admired and respected. He admired lawyers. His son became a lawyer, Boyd Hubley. And we had a fine relationship. And uh, then he was succeeded by Art Hansen, uh, who came along the same year. Carolyn came back to Purdue, and Art gave her the job, mm -hmm. you know and so on, and we had a good relationship. Uh, he retired, oh, three or four years after I had retired. He was there 10 years. Uh, Dr. Hansen? Yeah, Dr. Hansen. And, and we became good friends. He visited us, he and Nancy, up in Michigan in the summer several times. And we were on, we used to go to, most of the President's Council every two year trips and knew the donors that way and, and the board. Uh, the litigation work, the legal work for the university then was much less than it is now. Uh, Tony Benton, as you probably know, is a counsel now from the Stewart firm and he's got, I don't know, half a dozen or more people working. I had help from time to time, but I did most of the work. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some litigation. I tried cases for the university in the federal courts and in the state courts. Mm -hmm. Not many, a handful of cases. We a lot of contract work. Uh, Would this be contracts say, for the uh, construction for researchers? Might want just elaborate uh, just a little bit on and the, the and the research fund. Okay. A lot of work with the research fund, of course. R.B. ran the Research Foundation right. with the able help of Lynn Henschel, and, and I worked a lot with Lynn Henschel, great guy. Uh, but I got involved with the, the dean's uh, personnel problems. Uh, we had a librarian, of all things, who went AWOL, just didn't show up for work one, one September, and that was kind of a hassle that we had to work out. Uh, there, but there are more personnel problems now. They have, I think Tony must have two or three people working with the human resources section. I, I didn't have a lot of that. We had uh, quite a time in the 60s uh, with the uh, people like my daughter Marty who marched with the rebels and resented authority and opposed the war and so on. We had live-ins and sit-ins, as you know, uh, I remember a meeting in President Hubley's home after midnight one night and he called the deans and some others and said to us they occupied the union building the married students have moved in with kids and we've got students living in there and uh, what do we do <laughs> he decided he decided not to take the advice he got the, a phone call I think it was the captain of the football team, it might have been from the glee club, who offered to take a bunch of guys in and clean that place out. We said, no, we're not going to do that. But we did, he did send in the Purdue police. And, mm -hmm. and then we had a series of disciplinary hearings, of course. Mm -hmm. And with the prosecutor who refused to prosecute any of the cases in the courts. Uh, I would meet with President Hovde on more than one occasion. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what your, your liaison was also with the president as well as... Oh, the it was directly with the board. I was a, I, I okay. reported to the board. 
but day-to-day -day work was directed by RB or President Hubdi or somebody that he would say to call me. Like uh, uh, Morgan Burke was telling me the other day, he gave me a piece of paper that Joe Rudolph had given him uh, it's, uh, reporting a meeting between Cordy Hall and Guy Mackey in my office and when we formed the John Purdue Club. Yeah. When would that have been, you think? Well, it was about 50 years ago oh, because okay. this year they had the 50th. Oh, that, uh, that's yeah. right, they did. And, and at the meeting, why, uh, of the black and gold meeting, uh, Morgan Burke uh, mentioned that, that meeting. Uh, they, lo so, and behold. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, I got uh, work directly from the president and from uh, deans that he would direct a call. They normally didn't call uh, directly on their own. Uh, we had litigation involving the, the health center, the health facilities. We had litigation involving construction contracts. We had litigation with a professor up in the North Central uh, campus in the federal court. Uh, not a lot of litigation. I was handling until Russ Hart came along 10 years later after I'd been there, most principal part of our law firm litigation. As far as the university was concerned, I've been asked, what kind of time did you spend at the university as compared with your other clients? Well, of course, it varied. Oh, yeah. If I had to guess, in the, I was counsel for 27 years for the university. I would say probably somewhere around a third of my time, but it varied. I also was principally responsible for other clients, National Homes, uh, Great Lakes, Chemical, Arnett Clinic, and others. So it, my gradually I got out of the constant trial work. Uh, Russ Hart and John Bodle and others took it over. and. Uh, I did corporate work and the university work. Sure. So, I think I'm out of talk for the moment. Um, the, well, the President's Council, you've been active in that? Uh, yes, we've been members of the council. The, the, the law firm uh, made a contribution to the council immediately. Uh -huh. And uh, I became a member. We've always been members of the, of the President's Council and done a lot of on the trips because it was a time for us to to be with right. McCarroll and Mike. Right, that's right. And a number of the board members usually went. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, Bob Jesse, who's an old, old friend, uh, and Tim McGinley. McGinley was also an officer of National Homes Corporation at the time I was secretary. I understand that he was. I was secretary. He, was, he worked for them some one time, yeah. yeah. I saw a blurb on that. Uh, I was counsel and secretary of National Homes while Tim was there. Mm -hmm. So uh, we did a lot of things together there. Uh, you saw changes with people, the appointments would change, wouldn't they? People oh, yes. Coming on and off. Oh, yes. Right. The, the, the changes. How, excuse me, how did your appointment, did that just continue on? It, it, it just continued. Okay. Every, every year when the board would elect its officers, okay. I would be on the slate as, as, as elected and just like they elected chairman, it's a similar. Yeah, but okay. I, and I, I was never an employee. Okay. I, I never got a salary. I sent them uh, a, an attorney's bill. Right. In fact, one time, Guy Wilson, you, you know about Guy Wilson? Guy Wilson was a farmer, and he was a, on the board for many years. Or he was a great guy, a wonderful Purdue booster, and a lot of fun, and became a good friend. And uh, when he came on the board, to, Early in his years, was he from, was he from around here? Is he, he was uh, no, he wasn't from around here. Huh. I can't remember the section of Indiana where his farm was. I should, but I can't. Uh, one of his first questions was, "How do we pay Schilling? He keeps his own time." <laughs> and Harvey said, "We'd take President Harvey. We we take care of that." <laughs> we handled those details. Yeah, I think Brannigan was on the board at that time, and Brannigan said, "Were you?" What are, what are you crying about? You just cry all the way down to the bank with all the money you're making on your farm. 
the board was very congenial. And you know how they were appointed and where they come right. from. That's right. And uh, and you were on too when they a student got a vote was added on. Yes, well, right. when they 75. came, I heard the debate as to whether we should have a student trustee, and, and that turned out to be a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember one of the uh, student was he the student body president or or editor or both of the exponent was. Uh, Mike Gary's good friend. He's the commissioner for higher education. Stan Jones. Stan Jones, when he was a student. He was somewhat of a problem as a student, and I won't go any farther than that. And I never had it, we did nothing serious, but Stan was a, I don't know. He used to, he, when he was running, he would be, I remember seeing him in the union. He'd be in there talking to the students. You know, when he was running yeah. you know, for student government, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, he was very active and a very able guy. And he was president of the student government. I think he was. Yes, yeah. I yeah. think so. Yeah. But uh, it's uh, sort of ironic to me that he's now commissioner for higher education because <laughs> he was kind of this way with the university on a lot of issues. But that's all right. Yeah. He's, been, been. he's been with him, uh, that commissioner for quite a while. Oh, a long time. Yeah, yeah. a long time. Yeah. Uh, well, there, there was a significant, of course, change in personnel. Uh, even doing, during Hovde's administration. And Hovde was there 25 years. Uh, R.B. retired. His job was taken by Lytle Freehafer, who had been state budget director at one time. That was his background. And he took R.B.'s job. Uh, extremely capable. Wonderful, and I say the same about his successor, Fred Ford. Mm -hmm. I w worked with those right. RB to Prehafer to Ford, and I retired when Ford was still there. The, in my view, the financial affairs of the university have been served by excellent care by th those three men, and I have been to meetings with R.B., I recall specifically meetings with with uh, his counterpart at IU and their council, and uh, they were they weren't at the same level at all. He just they just weren't prepared. R.B. was just head and shoulders above him, uh, and he had that reputation, and uh, he could deal as president of the. Or not president, but the, really the CEO of the Research Foundation, with big name people around the country on a on an equal level, and, and they respected him. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a very satisfactory, rewarding experience. I would say so. And uh, it was. Uh, How did the campus? Do you notice the campus changed over time too? Didn't it? it grew. Campus changed. Of course, the the Hufti period was a period of no private money. We didn't even have a development office. Art Hansen started that. Right. Last school in the Big Ten to have a development office. Because the legislature provided the money. And uh, uh, That's a big shift, and that's an area that we're trying to fill in the, those after the war and, and during that because it's been meant, but there's not a lot of data that's been gathered over time. So it's, a, it's kind of a key... Thing, and Hubdi was on for a long time. Hubdi was his book there for was a good, long time. Right. John Hicks was his right. uh, uh, representative to the legislature. Right. John did a great job mm -hmm. in many capacities. Uh, assistant president, as you know, for a while, or acting president. Uh, but the money came pretty easily, and money wasn't a big problem. The research foundation grew by leaps and bounds, and that was due to R.B. Stewart, as, as, to my knowledge. And the mechanism that he hit upon was to impose upon every grant of funds from whatever source uh, an indirect cost to the university, or to the research foundation, for handling all of this. At one time, I think it was a 2%. And I can be wrong about these things. This is a long time ago. Uh, 
that that helped build the funds that the Research Foundation was able to generate. In fact, I think it got to the point where R.B. voluntarily reduced it a little bit. He got maybe a little feeling we're overdoing this. But it was a legitimate way. People, it wasn't on the underhanded at all. It was there for everybody to way see, and, sure. and, and the people paid it. But it provided the Research Foundation with funds it wouldn't otherwise have. The Research Foundation was very active. Uh, RB was very interested in aviation. He was a prime mover behind the development of the Purdue Airport. He hired Grover, what was his name? I want to say Grover Whaling, but that was the mm. governor of New York. Grove, Grove, Grover, Grover, somebody, was the first and long time director of the Purdue Airport. And uh, RB was able to get grants for the airport. Uh, he became interested in uh, uh, the airlines that were serving the airport. At one time, Wisconsin Air served Purdue Airport. I went with RB one time to, I guess, I think it was Milwaukee. And he was negotiating actually to, to buy an interest in, in an airline on behalf of the Research Foundation. And uh, I've forgotten how all that worked out. Uh, it finally all evaporated. But uh, before it did, R.B. was the director of the Research Foundation. I'm not, I'm not sure he was a director of the Research Foundation. He was an officer of the Research Foundation. He was director of Wisconsin Airlines, and he was director of another airline. And uh, did you ever read the book written by Lytle Freehafer's wife, Ruth, The Life of R.B. Stewart? I have not read it. I've just glanced at it. Okay. Yeah. She wrote that. And uh, she recounted an instance in there involving what I was just talking about, so I'll pass it on and you can look it up. Okay. okay. I was on vacation in summer at our summer home in Michigan. I got a phone call. I, we were building our first cottage up there. I, my dad and I were putting on the roof. and We had a phone hooked up on the tree. And the phone rang, and it was Harvey <laughs> Stewart. What are you doing? Well, I'm working on my roof. Well, when are you going to get home? Well, in a couple of weeks. Well, he said, I've just been sued as the director of such and such uh, airline for a breach of fiduciary duty as a director for $100,000, you get off of that roof and you get down here. That's what she's got. That's the way she tells it from him, I guess, in, in, in the book. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> and it happened that way. So, but R.B. was so wise in, in so many ways. He, he saw the necessity for acquiring land surrounding the campus. And he knew the campus was going to have to expand. And his instructions to the real estate people, usually the Shook Agency, were buy it. If you pay, if you want to offer 10% more than anybody else is offering, do it and get the land. And that's what he did. And we only had one instance where we ever, that I was involved in, that we ever had to threaten the use of the power of eminent domain, which the university had. And that was the, what was the bookstore. It was not where it is now, where the university bookstore is across the street. It's where the Cranach building is. And uh, they didn't want to sell. And we threatened eminent domain and finally got it. Was there a bookstore there at one I time? I think it was a bookstore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I can't be sure about that, but I have a feeling it was a bookstore. The owner was represented by Warren Eggleston, who's now passed away. That was Cable Ball's firm, Ball and Eggleston. And we we arrived at a settlement. We had other instances where we avoided litigation, of course, if possible. Right. There was a case when President Hubdy was president where a department head, and I won't go into it any further, a department head had 
in fact hired a, a new faculty member. He hadn't arrived yet. And it turned out he was over at Ohio State and he was very active in the press as a communist agitator, labeled as such. Well, our conservative board of trustees was not about to have this man, not only on board, but he had been promised tenure. And they said, Schilling, he's not coming. I said, you cannot hire or fire someone on the grounds that they're associated with the Communist Party under the law. If you have a lawsuit, you're gonna lose. But if you want a lawsuit, we'll have a lawsuit. They said, you go get rid of him some way. And we did. And went over and talked to the president of Ohio State, and talked to the lawyers. And for the, he had the faculty, national faculty, what is it, American Association? AAUP. AAUP representative. We settled it. And he out. didn't come. <laughs> worked out. Yeah. It worked out. Yeah. But it was things like that. And, and then there would be crazy things. Lyle Freyhafer called me up one Saturday morning of a football game, and he said that so-and-so student organization is demanding the right to land by parachute somebody on the field at halftime to advertise their activities. What do I do? Tell them no. <laughs> you know, and then there was a period during the Hudson administration when there was no liquor in West Lafayette. Except the chocolate shop. Except that was the chocolate shop. That's what I've heard. And then there was a, a company applied for a license, and our and the president heard about it. But the chocolate shop was they selling liquor? I don't. Oh, no, I no, think it was maybe just beer. Beer. Oh, okay. All right. But he wanted to uh, us to oppose any uh, liquor store. Uh, well, that was all handled without any big publicity. And things like there were issues that came out in the student exponent that, which come out today that shocked me today. It shocked, it were mild that shocked President Hudson. And he said, I want you to go talk to the United States District Attorney. They're using the mails to distribute this stuff. And I did talk to him. He said, Schilling, he said, forget about it. What you're seeing going through the mails from Purdue is nothing to what we got elsewhere, and I can't do anything about it. But you see, times kind of shifted with their attitude as to what's permissible. That's right. And so that all developed somewhat during the time I was there. When you retired from the board, did you retire from the firm as yes. well? Yes. Okay. Yes. Did you, did you decide to retire? Or was yes. It? Oh, okay. Yes. Very early. I was only 58 or 9. And what have you been doing during retirement? <clears throat> you had plans, of course. Well, I had plans... We had done a lot of traveling with the President's Council and did thereafter. Uh, we wanted to do that. Uh, uh, we had had some investments that, with Social Security and, and a small retirement fund that the firm had would, I thought, uh, permit us to do it. Uh, I had a, a, an interest in photography and this was a major factor. I wanted to go further. Since Army days, I had in the Army days, I had wandered into a dark room, and I got excited about that. So I had fussed around with photography, and I had taken workshops around the country, and I had taken some work at Purdue at night while I was practicing. And I finally went to Vern Cheek, who was a professor. Did you know Vern? I, I'm, I met him, yes, I know who I said, Vern, I want to get into this a little deeper. I've been to Ansel Adams' workshops. I've been here and there. He said, well, that's fine. He said, I'll take you on, but you got to become a graduate student. I said, what do you mean a graduate student? I'm practicing law. I can't go to graduate school. He <laughs> says, yes, you can. You can stretch it out. You can get a master's degree. Take four or five years. Take the hours when you can take them. He says, you're going to have to take all the stuff. You're going to have to take art, art history, painting, drawing, etching, lithograph, screen, silk screen, the whole works. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So I did. And I got my master's degree just about the time we I decided to retire right after that in photography. So I did do a lot of, I never was did it commercially. My sure. daughter, Marty Schilling, graduated in fine art photography from IU, and she was a professional photographer for a while. She 
got the bug from me, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of that. I spent my time. But then when we moved to Michigan, we moved to Michigan when I retired to our home up there. And uh, didn't live here for 20 some years. We didn't come back here till 1999. But in Michigan, I got active in various community activities. Uh, particularly, they were about to uh, bestow upon us unwillingly a national park in our area, Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. It is and has been for the years. And I got involved in opposing that and became president of the Citizens Council and did a lot of work in Lansing and in, in Washington and mm -hmm. got some changes through the Congress and, and so on. And so that, and then we had a great social life. And then I re renewed my interest in piano, started taking piano lessons again. I was busy. That's what I say. I you have busy. a, um, I, I usually ask people, you got an outstanding event in your life that comes to mind? Outstanding event? Mm -hmm. Meeting my wife. Sounds good to me. Number one. Yeah. Any uh, general observations or comments in closing that you could think of? No, I, I, came here as an IU graduate and and not only that but from an IU family <laughs> and uh, uh, but I became acquainted with loyal Purdue people of our, our age you know, like Jim Rush and others and became got to know some of the coaches and it took about a year and I was rooting for Purdue and we've been loyal loyal Purdue ever since Purdue's a, such a large part of our life. Right. And uh, I was I became very good friends with Earl Butts and, and other deans, Dean Fendler, uh, Al Stewart, uh, and uh, I even got on the board of directors of the Alpha Phi, my wife's sorority, when they built the house here. Charlotte Stewart was an Alpha Phi. <laughs> and Jim Shook and I uh, <laughs> got on the board of directors helped with the financing. Uh, so, I guess that's the story. That's very good. Thank but, you very much. This concludes it. Thank you very much. All right. I hope I didn't run no, over your time. No, no, no. You're fine.